Tonight, I'm going to be very selfish. I'm going to be preaching and teaching something that's going to help me. Um, and you're invited to go with me for a few weeks. Uh, but this is all about me. This is all for me. And um, you're invited to come along. Because the Lord's dropped some um, one thing for the church that's bigger than I've ever needed to um, receive before. And so that affects you. So I'd like for you to, you know, come along on that one. And I got a couple of things personal that he's doing. So um, actually what I'm going to do, because I know you're all in the same, uh, going the same way. We're moving into the end of this year. Come on, it's still double jubilee. Yeah. Amen. He said it's a mark on our church until he comes. So you're just going to, you're going to keep on winning Amen. and winning and receiving and receiving. And so just uh, while we were away praying, you know, for the week, we celebrated our 24th wedding anniversary. Yeah, we had a good time. And uh, we went to a condo um, in Perdido Key and relaxed. And uh, we didn't fast and pray. We ate shrimp and prayed. And so, um, and the Lord was okay with it. And so, um, and some fresh fish and all that kind of stuff. But one of the things that he just dropped, you know, um, some of you may be new to the church or, uh, and some of you have been with me since the storefront and a lot of you, especially since the A-frame. And um, I think back when we moved into this, we presented the master plan of this 17 and a half acres. Well, there's, there's one more. It's a big one. And a couple Wednesday nights ago, um, we, we were having us a, a, a Holy Ghost meeting on a Wednesday night. And if you'll remember, I got pretty drunk in the Holy Ghost and um, the Lord talked me into it. And he talked me in. I mean, it's always been on the plan, but I, I've just been wanting to take a break and, um, you know, let's rest a little bit on our laurels. I mean, we got, you know, you look at this as all one building, but really this is two buildings. And then we got the third one done. And, you know, y'all been riding up and down on that elevator? <laughs> you need to go over that AIM building right up. Not tonight. You can't if you're not a worker, approved worker. But anytime we're over there, just ride up and down on it. Hallelujah. Um, just for fun. It's only one floor. Hallelujah. It's just for fun. Anyway. But um, so, you know, and so we were away praying and the Lord said, I had to get you drunk so that you would agree. <laughs> just meditate on that one a minute. And so, but anyway, he uh, he's really was talking to me. Rhonda's always been on go with this one. But, um, you know, it's a little bigger than my mind. And uh, so what I'm going to do is reposition myself. And I'm, and I'm going to position you. Some of you need repositioning. Because remember this building here. I don't know if you've ever had to believe for millions of dollars. Have you ever had to believe for millions of dollars? Um, you know, or and see that everything's done. And um, even with, you know, so corporately you've all been helping and everybody's been obeying. But, you know, uh, sometimes as uh, when it feels like it's on you. It's called pressure. It's called weight. It's called no rest. It's called feeling like you got to do it yourself. And sometimes it's really good when it gets beyond what you can do. <laughs> As if I ever thought I could do any of this. Right? But um, so, you know, I'm going to reposition myself and so I'm going to talk about some things. And then, you know, some things personal, you know, the Lord's talking to me about. But I know I'm in the right room. I want to help you. Because really going into this next year, um, you know, we're going to, we're going to, um, we're going to, yeah, we're going to just do it. Just like Mark and Verna, they're going to hit next year running. We're all going to, we're going to hit it running too. Amen. Your run may be different. Today while we we're praying at noon prayer, we were talking about it's time to run. The Lord, he's so funny with me sometimes when I pray. I love that t-shirt. Wesley, that's the best T-shirt he's ever done, isn't it? That mighty man's T-shirt. Anyway, um, so so we were we were praying, and uh, the Lord, so he's this way with me. You know, uh, I don't know if your uh, relationship with him is boring. Mine is not. And he kind of jabs me and pokes at me every once in a while. Um, I I'm amused by a dry sense of humor. Um, I, so he he kind of amuses me every once in a while, and. Uh, so we were praying about it, and uh, I was praying about running. And he said, you've been at a good jog. And I thought, and I prayed out, I thought we was running. I really did think we was running. And he said, you've been just going at a steady good jog. 
it's time to start running. And then I started praying out, they're gathering in heaven to watch you run. They're gathering in their grandstands to watch you run. It's time to run. It's time to run. So we got to get some things done, and you personally need to get some things done. Now listen, when I talk about, um, we're going to talk about the subject that maybe you've never heard at Cornerstone Word of Life Church. We're going to talk on the subject of faith. So, and we're going to talk about how to reposition you. Because I was thinking about this building, and I remember when it got heavy on me. And the Lord asked me a question, and you all know this. And so you know when anybody preaches faith, hopefully you listen to it, receive it, understanding this. Because he asked me this question. He said, Mark, does your faith move me? And some of you may be new and maybe never heard me say this before. And I was like, I know the answer. So I was really excited to tell him, yes, because I thought I was being really, you know, a Mr. Faith man. Because I've been preaching on this for a long time. At that time, probably 25 years. I said, yes, Lord. I was excited. I know the answer to this question. My faith moves you. And he said to me, I don't need your faith to move me. I've already been moved. And just like a lot of things in your life, you have the written word of God on it. He's already been moved. He's already moved to heal you. He's already, he already became poor so that he's already met your needs. He's already moved. And what you're going through personally, he, he's touched with the feeling of your infirmities or your weakness or what. He was so moved by it. He became bruised. The chastisement of your peace was on him. He's already been moved. If you're praying or you think you got to get a prayer meeting going or you're praying trying to get God to do something about something he's already done, you are out of position and you're not in faith. You're not in faith. And so see, if, if, if just because, um, you know, you're around faith teaching doesn't mean you're in faith. Just like go standing in a garage and going vroom, vroom does not make you a Mercedes Benz. Right? We have to understand how to receive from God. So I'm going to reposition. I'm going to make sure I'm doing okay, and I'm going to take you along on a journey, all right? Are you ready for it? Because I know God's got some big things for me, and I know he's got some big things for you. And he's dealing with me about some personal things. And yet, see, you listen to me. Fasting and praying changes you, not God. If you're not in faith about your marriage, if you're not in faith about your child, if you're not in faith about your career, if you're not in faith about your business, if you're not in faith about those things, you can fast. You can call the 1-800 prayer tower and get everybody to pray who's ever been anybody, who's ever wrote a book on prayer, and it's not going to change it until you're in faith about it. And you're not trying, God's hand is open. Your faith doesn't have to pry it open. His hand is already open to satisfy every living thing. You see, when you got born again, Jesus didn't re-die on the cross and get raised from the dead just for you. What happened? You received your salvation. You received it. How many of you wish you would have received it sooner? Right? And so it is with the promises of God that are yes and amen. If you'll be positioned to receive, you'll walk in them now and not in the later and hereafter. Come on, they're sure. It's a sure word of prophecy. Because he could swear by no... <laughs> his, woo, his hikapone. He's Sarata. His word is even above his name. You've got to take it. You know, um, those of you who have not yet been to Bible Institute, first of all, I don't know what you're waiting on. We have invited you year after year, and so you ought to get in it. Um, but one of the things, you know, but those of you who have already graduated, y'all remember your first class, first year, Pastor Mark, 
It was called Faith Foundations. One of my favorite classes to teach because one of the things I teach you is um, why we study faith. Faith is not a movement. Didn't start with Kenneth Hagin. It wasn't picked up by Kenneth Copeland. God emphasized some things through these men and women of God, but faith is not a movement. It's a foundational doctrine. It's not it's not, it's not a Pentecostal doctrine. It's not a charismatic doctrine. It's not a word of faith doctrine. It is a Bible doctrine. And so there are reasons that we study faith. There are reasons that we do this. There's the reasons that God, what he has, because um, the Bible says the foundation doctrine is faith towards God. Why do we study faith? Well, number one, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Just stop right there. Without you learning how to, what is faith for? It's learning to receive the promises that are yes and amen. What's faith for? It pleases God. It does. Until you're really receiving all the promises, you're not really pleasing him. Now, I know when they write on their little blogs and tell you, you ought not be healed, wealthy, wise, blessed. Your family ought not be the, the head and not the tail. They tell you that you're selfish. They tell you, blah, 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 blah. I don't care. I'm telling you what the Bible says. And until you learn to receive all the promises of God, you're not really pleasing him. You might look at that and say, well, I've got to have this thing, whatever faith is, because that, that pleases him. But it pleases him when you're able to receive everything that he has for you. It's part of it. The Bible says the just live by faith. I remember when I first started this church, the Lord told me, because, you know, I was just really green. I didn't, I didn't, I mean, my, you know, I wasn't green, but uh, I, I was just really young, and it was amazing those people came back. And so I remember one time, Dorothy Allen, a number of years ago, she, we used to have those cassettes. That's how long ago, you know, you know, back in the day. And she started our tape ministry, and she had them all, and she brought some in the office. She said, Pastor Mark, I found some of your old tapes. Do you want to hear them? I'm like, heavens no, I do not want to. I'm surprised you do. Anyway, and so. So, uh, you know, but anyway, I remember though the Lord spoke to me and he said, don't teach your people to have faith projects. Because isn't that when people think they need faith is when they got something going on. No, the just live by faith. This is how I live. And so that's why we're going to do this repositioning. The Bible says that you even have to resist the devil steadfast in the faith, right? Understanding faith causes you to get all your petition prayers answered. These are the reasons. So in doing, now, since this is for me, and you all do know I'm mostly kidding about that, but not 100%. Um, when I do things for me, um, I don't need a lot of run up. I just want to know. If I got something wrong, so I can fix it. All right, that's, that's me. Now, I've had to learn working with other people, that's not all them. Sometimes you got to, you know, even if you want to help someone fix it, you got to give them a sandwich. You're awesome, you're wonderful, you're the best thing I ever knew. Fix this. I love you forever. Um, you're good, doing a great job. Bless you. Smash them together and run out, you know, because you got a good one, fix it. You got a good one, go. Hallelujah. My sandwiches, the longer I'm with people, the less sandwiches they get. They just get the meat. Anyway, so um, so they just get the, the, the good stuff and you just get the chicken salad. Hallelujah, whatever you're eating. You understand? All right, so for me then to reposition me, I want to make sure there's no, un, there's no unbelief and there's no doubt. So we're going to look at those things. When I used to teach this, I lumped those together. Don't have any doubt and unbelief. Don't have any doubt and unbelief. Until I got to studying and found out they're two totally different things. They're two totally different things. So I want to make sure that I have no first unbelief in my life concerning the things that I am positioning myself to receive from God. So you all ready to go with me? Y'all ready? 
All right. So we're doing some inventory to reposition. So we're going to make sure that we don't have any of this in our life and in the area. Because listen to me, no matter what it is, and I don't want you to think of just using faith to be healed. Although how many know that's good? I don't want you to just think about using faith to receive financial blessing. We live by faith. And so if you've got something going on in your life, if you've got a habit you're dealing with, if you've got something, a, a sin that dogs you, if you've got something you need delivered from, you don't need to go through deliverance, you need to get in faith. Are you with me? Whatever you've got going on, I'm telling you, faith in God, in his word, will take you to the other side and it will sustain you. Thank God for the gifts of the Spirit. We see them around here in manifestation and we want more and more. We're, we want those. Thank God for the glory of God in manifestation laying on hands. I'll lay hands on you two, three times if you don't get away from me quick enough. I mean, I'll, ju I'll just love laying hands on people. So I believe in all that. But even after all that, in order to keep a miracle, to keep a healing, to keep your marriage strong, to keep your body strong, to keep your finances strong. This is a lifestyle of living this way. And it's just like driving or not driving or taking off on a plane. When you take off from the East Coast, if you just get a little bit off and you're trying to get Seattle, you're going to end up in L.A. if you don't adjust. Just a little bit. Right? So, number one, we're going to look and see what is, so what is unbelief? Y'all hear? All right, so unbelief, it's the word, I'm not going to try to say it. It's A-P-A-I-S-T-I-A. -A -I -A. Apostia. I said I wasn't going to try to say it. Faithlessness, and it means disbelief. So let's look at some of these scriptures. Mark chapter 6, verse 6. Mark chapter 6. So let's identify in any area, do we have any of this? Now listen, you can be thoroughly born again, filled with the Holy Ghost, speak in tongues and rhymes, and still not be in faith in areas of your life. I've watched this, done this with people. There are some people that seem to have, be able to be positioned to receive finances, but being healed in their physical body is harder for them. Sometimes people with things that are personal to them, their children, their marriage. Some people, they're able to believe God, take God at his word. Other people, it's just harder. So it you know, whether one area comes easy or not, the word covers it all and you can receive everything that God has for you because all the promises of God are what? Yes and amen. So be it. So let's please him and position ourselves to receive. Mark chapter 6, verse 6. And, it, and um, this is when Jesus is, um, remember he went to, to Nazareth, his own hometown, ready to have, get. The, I mean, he's ready. He's ready. Um, and what they're like, this is the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James. I mean, and they were offended in him. And that Jesus talked about, and everybody gets on this one, a prophet's not without honor, but his own country among his own kin. And that's true. And it says there, and he could there do no mighty work, save that he laid hands on a few sick folk and healed them. And he marveled because of their what? Unbelief. unbelief. What is unbelief? Unbelief, A, is a choice. Just salvation is a choice. You either choose to believe that Jesus is the Son of God and he was raised from the dead, or you reject that. It's a choice. Unbelief is a choice. Unbelief can happen for two reasons. One, a person just refuses to believe. Anyone that ever says to you, well, I just can't believe that, that's a lie. Because you can either believe something or not believe something. It is a choice. Believing is a choice. Everybody on planet earth has the choice to believe that Jesus is the son of God and raised from the dead. So unbelief is a choice. And the other, what causes unbelief? Well, unbelief just because they were offended at him. They, they, they looked at him very naturally. This is the carpenter's son. Right here's his mom. There's his brothers. There's his sister. We don't believe in him. And he could there do no mighty work. Unbelief chokes out the power, chokes out faith. It chokes out the anointing. Unbelief short circuits everything. And so, uh, the, so Jesus did what? What's the cure for unbelief? He said he marveled because of their unbelief, and he went around the villages teaching. One, of, one cure for, for some unbelief is teaching the word of God. 
So the only, so unbelief, can't, listen to me, unbelief is not prayed away. Unbelief is not fasted away. Unbelief is not prayed away in other tongues. Unbelief is not laid hands upon away. You know, am I making sense? The only way, pray for me, I, I, I can't believe that. That's, 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 that's not a prayer I can pray. I can tell you the word and say, now you have a choice to believe. You either believe that. I can't believe that Jesus heals. I just don't believe Jesus heals everybody. I just can't believe that. I don't believe that. I, my mama, I prayed for her and she didn't get healed. It's not the will of God to heal everybody. That is unbelief. You're choosing to take a circumstance above the written word of God. Is it true? Because listen to me. We'll just use healing. It is true everyone doesn't get healed even though it's the will of God to heal everyone. Why? Because everyone can't receive or doesn't receive is a better word. They're healing. It doesn't change the will of God. And it doesn't make me mad at anyone who goes to heaven. But they didn't get healed when they went there. Because there's no healing necessary in heaven because your spirit's not sick. <laughs> and you didn't become a flower or an angel either. <laughs> anyway, praise the Lord. Unbelief, the remedy for unbelief, the only one I know, is teaching so you can make my people, even said his people, perish because of a lack of knowledge, lack of understanding, a lack of wisdom, a lack of understanding. That's why we pray. The eyes of your understanding would be enlightened. That's why we pray. Command the blinders to come off of people's eyes. Why? So the light of the glorious gospel can get in. But make no mistake about it. Unbelief is a choice that can only be cured by revelation of the word of God. Let's look, up, let's look on. Mark 16. Are you feeling repositioned? We're starting to get repositioned. We're making sure there's no unbelief in any area. How can you tell if you're in unbelief or not? Well, by your words and by your actions. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Mark 16, 11 through 14. Um, and they, when they had heard that he was alive and uh, been seen of her, believed not. What? So the, the ladies came back saying, he's alive, he's alive. There's a song about it. He's alive. And then when they had heard that, when they would what? Heard. Isn't that how all the gospel, these ladies, were, these ladies were some of the first preachers. Take that, you religious people. I think it was on purpose. These ladies were the first preachers of the resurrection. And the, and the crowd that ought to believe them didn't, and they believed not. And after that, he appeared to another and formed unto two of them as they walked. Remember the road to Emmaus? And they went and told it unto the residue, neither believed they them. So then the two came on the road to Emmaus. They came back, and they didn't believe them either. What is unbelief? Now listen, don't you and I think that this can't happen to any of us in this room, no matter how long you've been serving God or um, how much scripture you got memorized or how many victories you've already won. Unbelief is sneaky. Especially if you have any contact with this dark world right now. Because the devil is trying to use that to wring faith out of you to put you back in your place where you belong. Just a mere human being. And so, I mean, come on, y'all. Listen, these guys were with Jesus. I mean, the ones that are talking, the, the, the ladies came back and said, he's alive, he's alive. Well, how many know Jesus already told them he was going to do it? And then he appeared, you know, to the two, and their hearts burned within him. And they came back, and, you know, and they're like, hey, it was him. And then um, verse 14, and afterward, he, Jesus, appeared unto the eleven that sat at meat. And he said, oh, fellas, it's okay. I, you know, I, I get it. I get it. 
you know, it's hard if you can't really see it yourself. What did he say? He upbraided. What does that mean? What does that mean? He gave him, he gave him not a sandwich. <laughs> there was no sandwich here. He upbraided them because of their, not doubt, unbelief. They refused to believe the ladies, even though Jesus told them he was going to do it. They refused to believe the guys that were on their way to Emmaus. They refused to believe it. Now, I, if I was the Lord, I might be a little discouraged right now. Because this is who you're leaving everything with. I remember I heard, used to hear people say that, you know, the Lord really trusts humanity. He left all this with us. And then I heard someone on the inside say, not true, not true. He said he left it to me. The Holy Ghost. It's expedient for you that I go away. Come on, the Holy Ghost through humanity is what makes all this thing work. Because you know, our humanity, sometimes we can get real fickle, real. You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. You're not going to the cross. Get behind me, Satan. It can happen to all of us. Come on. Anytime you think you can't fall, anything time you think you have arrived, you could be in a trouble. So we need to keep ourselves humble. You know, what Mary was talking about, you know, now's not the time to get all proud. It's time to remember what the Lord God has done for us. Amen. Amen. And understand it didn't come from us. It came from him. Hallelujah. All right. So Jesus upbraided them. <laughs> Woo. He upbraided them with, with their, because of their unbelief and hardness of heart. So a lot of times with unbelief, there's a hardness of heart. I mean, you know, out of your heart flow the issues of your life. And if, you have, if your heart is hardened towards something, then, you know, and this, is, this happens sometimes. People's heart is hardened towards portions of the gospel because they've maybe seen something misused. Or they didn't know enough to receive from the Lord. And now they're, they're mad at God. They're mad at people. They're, they're, they're upset. And they're, they harden their heart to certain portions of Scripture, even. Well, let's look at John. You know, I know when I get to see Thomas in heaven, he's, we're, we're all probably going to be, especially all the preachers, probably going to be in a line. But because he wants to probably talk to us all. But John chapter 20, verse 24. But Thomas, one of the 12, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. How many of you know y'all should be where you're supposed to be all the time? Amen. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails. Unbelief demands physical proof before it will accept it. Unbelief demands physical proof. Unbelief demands to see the money until you'll move on what God told you. Unbelief demands that you feel like you love your spouse before it all get fixed. Unbelief demands that your child come home and say they're sorry before you can see it well and everything fixed. Unbelief demands to see something in the natural before it will accept it as true. Except I see in his hands the prince of nails, put my finger into the prince of nails. Oh, he's really going all in. And thrust my, oh man, I, I want to see, I want to put my fingers in his in, the, in his hand. I want to thrust my hand into his side where they put that sword. And after eight days, uh, again, the disciples were within and Thomas was with them. And Jesus came and the doors being shut and stood in the midst. He said, peace be unto you. Then he said, to Tom, he said, hey, fellas. And then he talked to Thomas. He said, reach. The Lord is so nice. 
Here he's being nice. Reach your finger, behold my hands. Reach your hand, thrust it into my side, and be not faithless. Unbelief causes you to be faithless. Where there's unbelief, there is zero faith. When you're not, when you're in unbelief, you have zero faith in that area. For instance, when someone does not believe that Jesus was raised from the dead, when they don't believe that, there is zero chance of them getting born again. Zero chance. They are faithless. And until they hear the word of God and believe the word of God and believe that Jesus was raised from the dead, they cannot position themselves to receive salvation. And so, now in this case, what is Jesus doing? Y'all with me? So he said, he said, Thomas, because you've seen me, you believe. Blessed are they. Everybody say, blessed is me. Why? Because I've never seen and yet I believe. Amen? So, you know, even Thomas, I've told you some of you this before, Thomas has been given the wrong nickname. What do we call him? That's not what he was doing. He's unbelieving Thomas. Sorry, buddy, if you're in the grandstands, but I'm sure they could write stuff about all of us too, right? But he's not doubting Thomas. He's flat unbelieving Thomas. Because he said, unless I see it, I refuse to believe that. What, what is this? I know that that Jim dude on Sunday morning talks about it, and, you know, he has this rotation on Wednesday night. But um, that tithing stuff, that doesn't make any sense. And, and I, I just don't believe that. I, I just don't believe you can give 10% and God's going to open some windows in heaven. I just don't believe that. I just don't see how that's possible. Uh, you know, that, that doesn't make any sense to me. And um, therefore, I'm just not going to do it. I like the music there at that church, but I'm just, I, you know, I'm just going to whatever they want to do. You know, they're probably them name it and claim it and grab it and blab it. And they're them prosperity. You know, I, I, I love the music and that preacher, he's okay. But I, I just don't think that works. What is that? That's unbelief. That's not doubt. That's unbelief. That's faithlessness. That's choosing to not believe a portion of Scripture. And with that then, there'll never be any corresponding actions, even if they tip God because they feel guilty. Now listen, don't anybody get mad at me. They ought to keep that tip. Because they need it. Because God is not involved in their finances. Cannot be. Except by his mercy. Cannot be in the middle. He's in the middle of mine. He, I believe in tithing so much, we do it as a church. From offering number one. Whatever you got coming in, we got 10%. And now more than that going out. Because I believe in it so much. I believe it. I believe it will work for me personally. It opens the windows of heaven, not only us personally as a family, but it opens the windows of heaven over our church. Hallelujah. We have more, we got a mighty big bank, as a church, we got a mighty big bank account. I was fretting over some stuff and somebody came up and told me that it's all right to make a withdrawal. You have more than enough in. And so I did it for this other thing, and something, and then yet I know that's kind of even the building. I believe, and we're going to keep doing it because we are tithers as a church. Because we take care of the nations and people getting born again and trained for the ministry. God looks upon us with great favor and the windows of heaven are open to us and everybody who is included in that tithe. Your tithe is always working. It's getting people born again all over the world. It's training ministers to get, to get people. I mean, it, amen. Even when, even when I don't see it, he's working. He's working because we have put it into practice. Amen. All right? But someone who's unbelieving, can you see they've got to see it for themselves before they're going to do anything about it? The only cure is being taught the word of God. Uh, Romans chapter 4, verse 20. Abraham and Sarah receiving Isaac. He said, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13. 
Paul talking about himself. He said, who was before a blasphemer, a persecutor, an injurious, but I obtained mercy. I obtained mercy because I did it in ignorance and unbelief. So see, do you see that word? Why was he unbelieving that Jesus was the son of God? Remember when the two of them met? What, what did Paul say back to him? He said, to, remember what Jesus said? He said, why are you persecuting me? And he's like, who are you, Lord? I know you somebody. <laughs> but right now I don't know who you are. Who are you, Lord? He gave him the title of Lord before he even knew who he was because of his awesomeness. And, he, and Paul said, I receive mercy. Are you, anybody grateful for the mercy of God? So God's not hard, not a taskmaster, but, but what was the cure for his unbelief? He said, I did it in ignorance and unbelief. So what will cure that? Knowledge of the word, of who God is, of who Jesus is. Come on, you keep hanging around here, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna get the knowledge of the truth of who God is. If you, if you keep looking at the word, if you keep reading the scripture every day, if you keep meditating the word of God, you're going to have knowledge. You, you're not going to be ignorant in any area. And so therefore, that, that knowledge removes ignorance, which causes you to get into belief or faith, which is from the heart. Amen. Now, there are people who then know and have heard the truth, but then they willfully, willfully. So those people, the Lord told me, are not deceived only, but they have deceived themselves. And someone who has deceived themselves is very difficult to get them out of that deception and into faith. Because that's when, come on. You, you know people who are self-deceived. What does that mean? That means um, they don't really know who they are or they're lying about something and they believe they're telling the truth. They see the situation wrong because they're not only deceived. How many know the devil is a deceiver? And he's trying to deceive people from the truth, put blinders on their eyes. Well, you can command those blinders to go. But if someone has willfully chosen after warning and warning and people coming across their path or sitting and listening to uh, the word of God and then they, uh, they reject it, there's a big difference in that kind of thing. Paul said, and I, hope, I think we're all, I, I, for you to be here on Wednesday night, you were maybe in that category once before. Aren't you glad you're ignorant no more or you're getting out of your ignorance I'm still, I'm still growing, are you? I don't know everything yet. I'm still learning. He's a big God with lots of revelation to be had. Amen? Okay, so that's unbelief. Now, let's look at this one. So the word doubt is diacrino. It means to withdraw from and it means to hesitate. So we've looked at what unbelief is. What are we doing? I'm repositioning myself. I'm repositioning you. I'm looking at an inventory, and I'm looking at the things that I uh, want to receive from God as I'm living my life of faith, and I'm making sure that there's no unbelief in that. Where, because if it happened to the 11 who walked with Jesus, and he told them personally, you can tear this temple down in three days and we'll lift it back up. They were there. It's expedient for you that I go away. They're all sitting around eating, you know, taking, you know, the Passover. And in John, I mean, he, we get to see it, how he talks and talks and talks and talks. And he prepares them. It's expedient for you that I go away. Because if I don't go away, the comforter can't come. But I am going to go away. No, we want to go with you. No, you can't go where I'm going right now. You're going to have to stay here. So he told them all about it. And then, you know, the two ladies come, we don't believe you. Two guys, we don't believe you. Jesus comes in, he wasn't thrilled with them, right? And so for you and I, don't anybody get upset, but he wouldn't be thrilled with us if we were in unbelief in any area. Because you and I, we know better, right? 
So let's just say all of us, and you needed to know that, just we want to check, make sure. But I would say most everybody in this room right now, unbelief is not your problem. Because if we just went through some of them, how many believe it's the will of God for everybody to be saved? How many believe it's, every, it's the will of God for every born again Christian to be filled with the Holy Ghost? How many believe it's the will of God, according to 1 Peter 2, 24, Matthew 8, 17, Galatians 3, 13, and 14, for everybody to be healed physically in their body? How many of you know 3 John 2 said, Beloved, I wish or I pray above all things you prosper and be in health. How many you believe it's the will of God to prosper you? How many of you believe that the angels of, God, of the Lord surround you, protect you, watch over you, that he protects you in all his way because you abide in him and his word abides in you, then you can ask him whatever you will and it will be done. Why? So that your joy would be full. Amen. How, so, so, see, for most of us in this room, unbelief is not the issue. We've got to make sure we keep it out. But this next one, this is the issue. This is the issue. It's called doubt. And so let's look at it. So it's diachrono. It means to withdraw from. It means to hesitate, stagger, or waver. And so in Mark chapter 11, verse number 23, it says, Verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say to this mountain, this obstacle, this circumstance, be thou removed and, not, and be thou cast in the sea and shall not do what? Yeah. Doubt. Not, not believe, but doubt. Shall not waver. This is doubt. And it's just easy to use uh, financial prosperity. Man, I'm a tither. I'm a giver. And I really believe that the windows of heaven are open. But I just don't understand why this is not working. I, I, I tithe and I give and, man, I get excited. But, um, you know, um, man, it's just hard right now. And uh, I, don't know, I don't know what's taking the Lord so long. You know, I really believe that he meets all my needs according to his glory in Christ Jesus. But I don't know what the holdup is. What is that? You think that's just you chatting. That's doubt. That's doubt. That's hesitating. That's wavering. You acknowledge that God's word is truth. His hand is open whether you're in unbelief or doubt or faith. It's not on God. That's why we're repositioning ourselves, making sure we, it's not, we don't have any unbelief, but... But this doubt thing, am I, am I in the right room? Whoever not doubt in his heart but believe those things which he says shall come to pass and have whatever he says. Listen, doubt does not mean there's no faith. Unbelief means you're faithless. You have zero faith in that area. Doubt does not push out the faith that you have, it just overwhelms it and strangles it. Because you're thoroughly born again, aren't you? So we've believed, in my mind, the hardest thing there ever is to believe. That a Savior has come, born of a virgin, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. He went to a cross that we never saw. He went into hell, he says. He took all your sin, your sickness, your disease. On the third day, he says the Holy Ghost went down into hell and pulled him up, and he took his blood and put it on a mercy seat and sat down at the right hand of God. He says. Well, I believe what he says. That's settled with me. That's settled truth with me. I doubt that not. I don't waver about that. I don't hesitate about that. I'm not due. I don't have two different mindsets about that. If you and I can get there, y'all believe your name's written down in the Lamb's Book of Life? How could you possibly believe that? You have never seen it. Anybody believe that Jesus is getting up a mansion for you up in heaven? Why? You just chose to believe that. Do you doubt that? Do you, do you ever think about it? I wonder if I really have one. I'm sure I've been so bad I'm going to get a log cabin. You understand? How many of you know, you, listen to me, do you ever hesitate about that? Do you, believe, do you believe the streets in heaven are made of gold? 
Why do you believe that? Because he said so. Have you ever, do you doubt that at all? It is possible that you can walk this walk without doubt. Same, same. Same, same. What makes it more difficult is that's heaven and you're putting it off. You have to deal with it right here on the earth. But I'm telling you, it's same, same. I know who I'm preaching to. I'm preaching to myself just like y'all. I get it. But it's true. The reason that it's because that's in heaven. There's no, that you, you, you've settled that because that's something later. But it'll work the same way. It'll work. My point is, it's possible. It's possible. So. Doubt doesn't mean there's an absence of faith, but the presence of doubt causes your faith to be overcome by the doubt. So what we got to do? We got to starve the doubt. Matthew chapter 14. Peter walking on the water. You all know this account. Thank God for Peter. Hey, Lord, if that's you, bid me come. Jesus said what? Come. Right? Matthew 14. Verse 20 said, come. Peter came was down out of the ship. He walked into the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately, everybody say immediately. Immediately. Thank God. Jesus stretched forth his hand. Should just meditate on that. Come on, immediately. I know, I know. A lot of people preach this, you know. But listen, Peter was in faith. How do I know? Well, he's walking on water. (laughs) But what happened is this. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said to him, you of little faith. That word little gives people a problem because they measure faith. And there is things such as great faith. But this little is not amount. It's longevity. This is not amount of faith, not great faith. Like, like you have great, like you have this huge amount of faith. Well, if you had grain as a mustard seed, you'd say. We get caught up on the great, but this word little is length of time. How many, Peter walked on some water. How did he do that? Because he heard the will of God. How does faith come? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The word of God said come. So what does faith need for it to work? It needs a lot of times words, but it needs corresponding actions. What was his corresponding action? He sat down on the side of the ship, wasn't a bass boat, on the side of the ship, tossed his legs over and got down on the water. And he began to do what? <laughs> he was walking on the word. He was in faith. But then something happened. What did Jesus say happened? He said, why did you have little faith? Why did you do what? Doubt. Doubt. So here we got Peter walking on the water. He saw in order for the devil to bring doubt to your life, he brings circumstances, pains, symptoms. In a marriage, he brings yelling, screaming, (laughs) slam doors. Words like you always and you never. With children, it's, (laughs) I don't know. I don't, anyway, I can, I can hear things right now. I hope that some of that's not going on in your home. Things like, I wish I was never born. How do you combat that? That's a circumstance. That's a wind. That's a wave hitting you in the face. What you and I do next determines if we're going to stay on top of the water or not. Now, we're not going to fault Peter because he walked on the water and he had faith. 
But when he saw the winds boisterous, because see what circumstances are meant to do is invoke fear in you. You can't do this. Peter's a fisherman. He's never seen anyone walk on water, even when it's calm. His mind fights him. If you're going to keep away from doubt, you got to get your mind renewed with the word of God. you got to rehearse what the Lord said to you. Because the devil will bring circumstances and doubt. And he'll bring people with doubt. And tell you, this is not going to work. Let me tell you why. And they'll give you their experience. (laughs) What does that do? It's trying to make you take your focus off of the word of God. All right? So what, what is doubt? So, it, But aren't you grateful? I love this. this is, I give you this picture all the time, but I love this. Help me, Jesus. Everybody say, help me, help me, Jesus. Come on, say it right. Say, help me, Jesus. Help me, Jesus. It's not help. It's help. <laughs> and, so, and so anyway, he picked him up, and what did he do? He didn't throw him back in the boat mad. He let the water under his feet again. And he said, why did you doubt? And I know the faith preachers, they'll tell you that's not what happened. But I like my version, and I think I've got a scripture to prove it. He taught him with water under his feet. God is not trying to make this hard for you. Walking in faith and receiving from God is not supposed to be difficult. And he's not angry. Except if you're in unbelief. In doubt, there was this, man, I I believe he was more like a coach right then. You were doing it, but you got your eyes on the wind and the waves, and you let something in. Jairus came to Jesus, and he said, come lay your hands on my daughter, and she will live. What is that? That's a statement of faith based on something he had heard about Jesus. He believed something. So he did something. And so remember then Jairus' servant or friend came and said, don't trouble the master any further. And Jesus said what? Don't be afraid. Or he could have said, don't be afraid. Don't let doubt creep in because it will stifle what we've got started here. It's already started. Even though with the woman with the issue of blood, we got time. She's got, she got her miracle, and I want to hear all about it. It's all right. What are you and I going to be doing right then? Well, I know if it's me, I'd be like, sister, you know, speed it up. I don't really, you got yours. Come on. <laughs> I, I'm serious as I could be. I, I am serious. I'm, I'm like, write it down, send it in. But um, we got to go. <laughs> But how many know immediately when Jairus heard his daughter was dead, what happened? Fear came. Because the circumstance is huge. But the miracle was already in progress because of what he believed. And Jesus said, don't be afraid because that fear will get you into doubt. And doubt will overwhelm your faith. What did your faith say? Your faith had nothing to do with whether she was dead or alive. Your faith was, come lay your hands on her and she'll live. And he's, Jesus was saying, that still goes. That still goes. That still goes. That still goes. We're still working on it. Come on, we're still working on it. Some of you need to pick up some things and dust them off because he was working on it. Because he was working on it. Because he was working on it. You didn't see it. You didn't feel it. But he was working on it. He had angels on it. There was on assignment. And and, and we got into doubt. We got into fear. And we said, okay, this ain't working. And we began to sink. And yes, the Lord picked us back up. But we got to go. We got to get back after it. Come on, we got to get back after it. Don't be afraid. Only believe. Only believe what? What you already said about it. And how many know, Jesus went there, kicked all the unbelief out of the room, told her to get up, and she, got, and she came back to life. Amen. Doubt is something. Let's look at this. 
Um, James 1, 6 through 8. What are we doing? I'm repositioning myself. I'm repositioning you. I'm just giving myself a Holy Ghost tune-up, tone-up. Amen? We all need one. Because there's some things that you and I are supposed to receive. Because it's double jubilee. Amen. Amen? And there's some things God has for you that you can only get by positioning yourself to receive. And yet doubt has tried to get in with circumstances and try to squeeze or override your faith. Here in James 1, 6-8. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. Nothing wavering. For he that wavers is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is what? Unstable in all his ways. So this is a man with two mindsets, wavering. Uh, it's that wave. What does the wave do? The circumstances are trying to take you somewhere. If you begin to waver, you're yielding to the wave. And that wave takes you and pushes you somewhere else. But what causes that? A person with two mindsets. A man with two mindsets. Now listen, how many know on Sunday morning or Wednesday night, it is easy to jump and shout and rejoice and believe. But when you open those emails on Monday or you get a text on Tuesday or a snap, what do all you all do? I don't know what you all do. I was trying to gonna be all hip and modern, but I don't know, Snapchat. I don't know what you do. Instagram, I don't know what y'all do. But you know, you get messages or you get things that are contrary to what you're believing. And whatever you decide at that moment to feed upon, to look at, what are we looking at? Because if you look at the wave long enough, it'll take you down. It'll move you. That's what it's meant to do. If you focus on, and I get it, it's hard. When you focus on the pain instead of the provision, it's very hard. When you focus on your check balance, checking balance, or your paycheck instead of the promise, what is that? That's a wave. It's a wind. When it hits you. And so what do I, what do I, what do I have to do? <laughs> what do you have to do? We have to refocus. And we have to be a man or a woman of one mindset. I like the scripture this way. It doesn't do any harm to it. A single-minded man is stable in all his ways. He shall receive everything from the Lord. A single-minded man, a man whose mindset, a woman whose mindset is the word of God and the word of God only, is stable, is stable in all of their ways. And they shall receive everything. All the promises of God are yes and amen. They shall receive everything in the Lord. So what do you and I have to do? We have to understand that doubt is something that you and I face and that we have to make sure that we understand what's coming. Um, there's all kinds of signs of doubt. We'll see where we get to next time. But this is, I really do, and I, I, I've, I've, said this years ago to some, some of you were here maybe, maybe you remember now. But I don't think as a whole, there's always new people coming at who've been taught wrong. But unbelief is not our main problem. Doubt is. And yet there's a cure. There's a cure. So what we focus on, keeping our mind renewed, keeping the word of God in front of us, reminding ourselves what God promised us. You know, a lot of things, 
I mean, you got to understand, he instigated all this. He's the one who said, by the stripes of Jesus, you were healed. You didn't have to ask for that. He instigated it. Do you know he didn't have to do that? About you being rich. That wasn't your idea. That was his. For you to have peace all the time and to be at rest. He said, my peace I leave you. Not as the world gives, so there's a false peace. He said, I'm giving you my peace. So that's where faith has to understand. All it is is receiving. It's not, it's not a talk you into anything kind of thing. It's not a uh, strain. Have you ever heard me say, I was believing so hard, I strained a gut. Well, that's just silly. That means the circumstances were weighing on me so hard, I got into doubt. That's what that means. I just, oh, I believe so hard. It was so big. Please. Nothing's too hard for God. Who do, we, who do we have to talk into this? Ourselves. You're not talking God into anything. A, a single-minded man or woman, stable in all of their ways. Not due, not two mindsets, single. What's the single? On the word of God, on the promises of God, on what God spoke to you. Come on, some of you listen to me. God's told you some big things. You, could, you didn't make that up. You delighted yourself in him. You're just loving on him, and he put something big in your heart. And he's the one's going to bring it to pass. He just needs you to believe what he said is true. Well, how long is it going to take, Pastor Mark? I can't, I can't wait no longer. Can't wait. He's slow. You know, I've been having this for years. Well, unfortunately, right there, that's doubt. <clears throat> it's, it, it's subtle. It's so subtle. It'll get you, though. So if you hear that, you can throw up your hand and say, it's all, forget it, I'm, I'm messed up. No, immediately. Immediately. He'll put you back on the water. The Lord wants you to receive. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. And I know somewhat that means, but I believe on the other side of that, he has so much stuff. He wants to daily load you down. I am getting so tired of these people who want to tell us that what we have is not true Christianity. That, you know, that God never promised you to heal you. Well, 1 Peter 2, 24 says he did. He never promised to bless you. 2 Corinthians 8, 9 said he did. So you got, I mean, that's case, okay, where I'm from in my old accounting days, that's case law. That's been tried. That's been tested. That's the truth. It's case law. <laughs> that helps somebody in the room. I've never said that before in my life, but that's what it's like. It's been to the Supreme Court. It's proven. It's the law. It's covenant. It's the way it is. It's what, he said what he meant, and you can have it. Amen? Our job, no unbelief and no doubt. And if you find yourself in doubt, what do you do? You fix it. How do you fix it? How do you fix it? Well, you, you, you push away the circumstances and you look at the word only. Because the circumstances try to bring fear to get you to be afraid, to get you to let go. Okay? It is possible. It is possible. If you abide in him, 
and his words abide in you. You will ask what you will, and it shall be done. It shall be done.